everybody. This is Dr. Diana Wiley, and I am your host of Love, Lust, and Laughter. So very pleased because Dr. Stephen Snyder, a psychiatrist who actually is also a sex therapist, he's been on this program four times before, but not since August, so I'm so pleased to have you <laughs> back, <laughs> Dr. Stephen Snyder. Thank Hello. you so much, Diana. And your again. book is your your book Love Worth Making is so worthwhile. The subtitle is How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long Lasting Relationship. And you have lots of suggestions for that. Um before we start formally talking to you, uh I, I I'm reminded of what my husband Brian said about your book and um he said it's an easy read. It offers a jaunty mixture of client stories and the doctor's good advice. Uh, one of your key messages, he says, you, and you sprinkle this throughout the book in various guises, is to be with your partner and just slow down and notice what's going on or not going on. And, of course, this is a mindful approach, and this can be very helpful in opening doors to creative solutions in a couple's life because you have slowed down and you're looking at things. Yes. Yeah, this is part of so the, slow sex, the slow sex movement. The slow sex movement. Yeah. Over the 39 years I've been doing this work, I've used those two words for lots of couples. Huh. Slow okay. down. Good, slow good. down. Good. <laughs> somebody, somebody, I read my book and they said, yeah, the basic message is it's going to be okay. Oh, yes, it's going to be okay. Yeah. But lots of folks don't feel like it's going to be okay. We we thought today we'd focus in on um can erotic love last? Uh I think that's very much tied in with your chapter 15, can sex survive monogamy? Is it not connected the two? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the uh, that's the chapter on can erotic love last. And okay. the main message of the chapter is it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So you, um, you're you're a bit of a maverick in a way that you do suggest things that a lot of sex therapists um, don't, and I like that. Um, and for instance, you say, so people say, well, how can you keep sex, sex desire alive, sexual desire alive, and and here's the secret. You write. You can't. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't. Nobody, nobody knows how to do that. Yeah, so expand on that. Unless you have, you'd like to talk about something before that. Cause no, no, I'm happy to, happy to talk. I'm, and, okay. uh, you know, we, you and I have been kind of slowly making our way through the book, and, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tremendously honored that you're, you're uh, doing this. Um, um, the, uh, um, most sex you. advice uh, is mm-hmm. advice about how to keep it hot. Mm-hmm. How to keep it hot, right? How to keep it hot. I mean, because that's what it's on the cover of all the magazines. How to keep it. How to how to keep the sizzle in your marriage and all that stuff. And most of the suggestions are things of you know go on a sexy date or a destination or uh, you know wear something new or get a new sex toy or something like that um, or introduce a little danger and do it in public or something like that and I, I really dubious about all these things uh, because it, it's a little bit like trying to make a sexual marriage into something that doesn't look as much like a sexual marriage but looks more like an affair and it's just, you know, your sexual mind really resists being hoodwinked that way. It knows mm-hmm. that that person at the bar is your wife or your husband. It can't, can't really fool it that way. And mm-hmm. so it doesn't like that. It doesn't like to be, to, to be fooled. The other thing about keeping it hot is it never lasts. You know, I always say Fifty Shades of Grey got a lot of American women very excited for a week and a half, and then everything settled back to normal. <laughs> so none of that stuff ever lasts because it's a part of the sexual mind that says, you know, what have you done for me lately? This happens with guys mm. all the time because, you know, as, as you know, 99.9% of guys these days are looking at Internet pornography because it's just so darn easy and cheap. Um, and uh, they'll look at something, and then a week later they'll look at it. It's just not as exciting anymore. 
And so the people who make the pornography are always trying to up the ante. And you see this in the media in general. Things that were shocking 10 years ago are no longer shocking. And things that are shocking for us aren't going to be shocking 10 years from now. So we're really just kind of... That's probably true. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so Atlantic, felt- Atlantic Magazine um, had a cover story, um, and this was uh, for this month, um, December, the sexual recession. Yes, yes. And... Yeah, and it's, I read it, it's a I read very, it it's it's a a very good article, and of course, pornography is part of the problem. We think so. Oh, I think one of the things that I liked about the article uh, by, by Kate mm-hmm. Julian um, is yes. that it didn't just give one answer. It said, we right. don't really know, but there are many, many aspects to this. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the economic recession maybe had something to do with it. Uh, people are very yeah. worried about their careers. Kids in college feel they don't have time for relationships. They just have a hookup every once in a while, but they're just, they're right. just very, very driven. No time. Mm-hmm. And uh, in general, people are on their phones and everything, but the porn probably has something to do with it. I know people in my practice who used to do a fair amount of getting out, and they say, I don't have to get out anymore. You know, porn is just so good these days, the graphics, the visual quality and everything. It's good. I don't even need to get out. And as mm-hmm. you know, in certain countries that are very, very highly wired, like Japan, there are a lot of young yeah. people who just seem to have given up on sex completely. So, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's I think it's part of the uh, part of the picture. Definitely part of the picture. Yeah, it's, 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 her, it's, her, it's, yeah. Well, her statistics on Japan were fascinating to me because um, in the early '90s, I did some research in Japan about the guy geishas, and these were men who, who were in these sex clubs, and no sex went on in the clubs, um, because I actually went to Club IAI, which is uh, Japanese for love, and, um, and it was fascinating, because the roles were totally reversed, and, and wealthy women, because it's fairly expensive to go to these clubs and drink and eat and dance, um, but these were women, and sometimes the husbands would actually drop them off at the club, realizing that that they were traveling and not taking care of their their wives. And and um, but the the Japanese uh, the demands of the real world relationships with women are less enticing than the lure of the virtual libido. They say in Japan, and um, they're they're going for. Um, high-end sex and uh, sex dolls, and um, let's see the the statistics. Yeah, in 2005, a third of Japanese single people ages 18 to 34 were virgins. By two, 2015, 43 percent of people of this age were. So that's 18 oh, to 34 are virgins. 43 percent. And so, and some people are deciding not to get married either. So, so they do have a fertility challenged problem in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Um, And, yeah, you know, we're we're not Japan, but uh, we're not night and day different. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know that uh, young people in the United States are not having as much sex as they used to. Yeah. And so uh, there's there's stuff going on. You know, we don't know exactly, but if we Mm -hmm. want to get back to couples. If you're in a yes, couple, I do. Um, most couples want to keep some erotic connection. Absolutely. And, uh, so the main thing for a couple is that when you lose desire for your partner, because everyone loses desire for their partner, that's normal. When you lose mm-hmm. desire for the, your partner, the first thing to tell yourself is that's normal and don't panic. It's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a bit of a maverick because I have a... I'm because I'm a religious person, and yes. I think most Americans are. However, very few people who write about sex talk about religion, which I think is a kind of a, a problem. So I either wisely or foolishly did this in my book in Chapter 16, which is uh, yes. uh, uh, mindfulness, sex, and heart, heart mindfulness and faith, or something like that. Um, uh-huh. And part of it is having faith that it's going to be okay, and mm-hmm. part of it is eliciting a part of sex that doesn't really get much attention these days. You'll often hear that sex is basically friction plus fantasy. And Mm -hmm. if you watch porn, that's basically what you see. You see a lot of friction, Mm -hmm. and you see fantasy. You see people who are beautiful, you know, having sex. Um, 
what you don't really see is the heart dimension. And that's the most important dimension long term. And it's the only part of sex that you can't really put on a screen. And it's the only part that you can't turn into a commercial uh, enterprise and a commodity. Mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. that reason, it doesn't get represented. But for most people, if they're really talking about keeping a sexual uh, connection with each other, it, it relies heavily on the heart dimension. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, mindfulness, the, the word for, for, for mind and heart in some Asian languages is the same word. So heartfulness is really implied in mindfulness, mm-hmm. as, every, as every advanced student of mindfulness knows. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. basically the technique that I recommend to couples Let's say you want to get together, but neither of you are really feeling much desire. What you do is you do what I call the two-step, where you lie in bed Mm -hmm. together, and you just be where you are, and you breathe, and you feel Mm -hmm. your toes, and you feel your feet, and you just locate yourself and your senses, and let your senses be where they are, and then you turn to your partner. And at that point, your heart channel is open, and your mindfulness channel is open, and it makes an extraordinary amount of difference. And you can really have really good sex, even though you didn't necessarily have any, quote, desire per se. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, so it's, um, it's very maverick, um, because... Yes, it is. Yeah, and, and that's and why I wrote you also the sa- you said um, that in, in the step one of the two steps, just... You're in bed. You're doing nothing together except being together, right? And and you can talk about whatever's on your mind, uh, anything at all. Doesn't have to be erotic. And then you suggest something very valuable. I think no big discussions, but but just you don't want to have any arguments on your mind. You're just hanging yes. out. You're just hanging out. You know, it's a little hanging bit like out. In, in mindfulness it's called mindful communication. One person will mm-hmm. say some things to the other, and the other will just listen and go, okay. Um, mm-hmm. You're not preparing a response or anything. You're just taking it in. So mm-hmm. you're just uh, being with and uh, attending to what, other, the other, what the other person is saying. And for most people, that's a very rewarding experience. I'm a firm believer in nothing. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that nothing is where all the good stuff comes from. And so it's like the old Zen proverb, don't just do something, sit there. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's good advice for a couple, especially in the 21st century. We're always doing things. You know, we're always just like trying to get another follower on Instagram or trying to get to the next level of yeah. the game or trying to get to the next this or the next that and uh, watching our stocks and if you're an author, watching your Amazon rank and, you know, all that stuff. And so uh, we just all keyed into our metrics all the time. And so mm-hmm. it doesn't make it difficult for us to do nothing. It is hard, and you you also point out in 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 your book about the differences between men and women that uh, traditionally um, the the woman uh, she ha- she tries to get a man's attention by showing what she has, or more precisely, who she is, uh, and his behavior emphasizes what he's capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Um, in, Can I this talk is a little bit about heterosexual. That? I want you to because yeah, okay yeah um, yeah because was, this is a difference between men and women and and it pre- and it presents roadblocks for some yeah I don't know how many of your listeners immediately uh, recognize uh, what it is that you're saying so can, can I can I restate it please yeah um, I was struck when I looked at all the sex books out there uh, mm-hmm. most of them seem to be kind of unisex. And mm-hmm. they talk about, uh, you know, desire and stuff in kind of unisex terms and mm-hmm. uh, sexual feelings in unisex terms when they talk about sexual feelings at all. Either that or they're almost all oriented towards women. And mm-hmm. they have to do mm-hmm. with uh, women learning to uh, uh, have better orgasms, how to know mm-hmm. where the clitoris is, how not to have pain, how to recover from trauma, how to like your mm-hmm. body better, all very, very important things. But they're either unisex or they're monosex. There weren't much male voice in there. And so as a man, I wanted to see if I could speak authentically from a male perspective. And uh, what I noticed 
is that there's a lot of confusion among the people that I see in my office. For instance, um, women, they read the magazines and they want to know what are the right kind of moves to do. What kind of Mm -hmm. things should they do? And I always say, forget it. You're the woman. You don't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. You just, if a guy's turned on to you, he's going to be turned on to you. That's the wonderful thing about being the woman. You don't have to worry about that. And a woman who's appealing to a man, I'm talking about heterosexual people, a woman who appeals to a right. woman too, but a woman who's appealing to a man, he's going to be turned on to her pretty much no matter what she's doing. And that's what mm-hmm. I was trying to express in the book. It just has to do with who she is. She doesn't have to worry too much about what she's doing. Um, and the proof of this is if you look at uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition or any yes. uh, er- erotic image of a woman, she's doing absolutely nothing. She's just sitting comfortably. She's just relaxed and so forth. And that's still a turn-on to, uh, to most heterosexual men. A man, on the other hand, very few women want to see a man doing nothing. And, That's right. Uh, That's right. They, you don't see, you know, there was a Playgirl magazine, but you know who bought it? It was gay men. Yeah. Gay men are, are wired like guys. <laughs> so they, right. they, they want to see a good-looking man doing nothing. They're totally fine with that. But a woman wants to see a guy doing something. So right. I always say that for men, it's, it's what can the guy do? You know, does, does he, is he doing something interesting? Can he make her laugh? You hear that a mm-hmm. lot from women. Um, and can he, uh, is he not boring? And does he have a level of ambition? Does he have a level mm-hmm. of uh, uh, action? And does he have energy? You hear that a lot. Is he confident? Mm-hmm. All things that you never hear from, from guys about women. You hear from guys just, yeah, I liked her body or I didn't. It's just really, really basic. But a man's eroticism usually to a straight woman, really has a lot to do with what he's doing with what he's got. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Mm -hmm. she appreciates it if he's fit and he takes care of himself and if she likes the way he looks and the way he smells and everything, but a lot of it has to do with his actions, which is kind of a a stress on guys. They can't just sit around. There's an old joke in, in synagogue, you know, how do you get your wife's attention? Sit in a chair and look comfortable. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, don't, don't tend to just love it when guys sit yes, around. It's, it's, not, it's not a turn on to them. I hear from a lot of from a lot of women. They're really worried when their men retire. They go, "What's he going to do all day? He's just going to sit yeah. around." Ugh, it's a turn off. Oh, so or or a, the the joke, the joke that I read years ago. I think it was in AARP magazine. Um, the wife is looking at her husband who's now retired, and she says, you know, I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Go out and do something. Get out of the house. Go out and do something. You have also, uh, and this figures into our discussion, a great quote from Mae West. I just love that woman. I think she was a woman ahead of her time. But it, the quote is, it's better to be looked over than overlooked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Obviously, that's a tricky statement in, uh, in yes, the it is era, in the current era because there's certain oh, kinds absolutely. of 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 looking over which are you know demeaning or harassing. Uh-huh. Yeah. One question, obviously, is is it welcome? Um, another mm-hmm. question has to do with the value of the individual who's looking over you. Uh, mm-hmm. Most women don't just want to be looked over by any person; they want to be looked mm-hmm. over by a high value individual, and. So, you know, because most women take a lot of care um, with their appearance and with who they are, and they present themselves well, and they take care of themselves, and they want to get some appreciation from someone who they feel is worthy of them. So mm-hmm. it has, it's, it's to, be, to be looked over by someone who, uh, who has some value, who seems worthy of appreciating them. Yes. Yeah. Um, does that makes sense. I mean, I'm a man. This is just my. Does that make sense? I think that word? that's absolutely true. And and there are anthropologists like Helen Fisher who say that we're hardwired, we women, to want a man who can provide for us. In and in early times, the the men might go around spreading their seed in very early communities, but a woman 
who was pregnant for nine months and vulnerable, wanted a man who could bring her more food. And she might even have sex with him, even if he isn't the, he wasn't the father of her baby. So yeah. this idea of having a man who can protect her is pretty hardwired, don't you think it is? Um, well, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very uh, contentious issue these days. All right, yes. Um, Talk about and that, And the argument against it, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I boil it down to what's sometimes called the man the hunter idea. Mm. Now, we know there's a lot to the man the hunter thing. We know that one of the reasons that a lot of men's uh, sports involve throwing and throwing balls and stuff is that throwing things, like throwing a spear and killing an animal, it was a big thing. Um, and men did go out and hunt. And hunters, largely male hunters, certainly in the New World, were responsible for the extinction of the mammoths and the mastodons and everything, all these large mammals. We, we wiped them out 10,000 years ago mm-hmm. when we came over from Russia. And same thing in Australia. All the large uh, forms of mammalian life were just wiped out by the hunters. Mm-hmm. So hunting was a huge thing, and the meat diet probably had a big role to play in the expansion and development of the human brain. So there was a division of labor. We know this going back Mm -hmm. at least 2 million Mm -hmm. years ago, probably longer, where the men did specialize in hunting and the Mm -hmm. women did specialize in childbearing, childrearing, gathering, taking care of, you know, the the, the village when when the men were hunting. However... The, the argument that's made uh, by uh, progressives these days is mm-hmm. you're reasoning about human nature from the behavior of modern women. And modern femininity is the result of thousands of years of, of, of work and of uh, experience. And you can't necessarily exactly reason. We don't really know that. We don't want to say that what we observe women doing today is exactly what women's proper nature is or hard wiring, because we can't really say for sure. And I, I think that, that that's an important objection, and I think it's a, it's a wise objection. However, I think if we look at, if I look at the behavior of women that I counsel in my office, they certainly are very concerned about, uh, the straight women, about a male partner's ability to be a provider. And mm-hmm. they're very concerned about whether he's done something significant in the world. Does he have a good job? Does he have a position where he possesses some power in the world? Mm-hmm. Or does he sit around on the couch? That's a turnoff. So mm-hmm. those things definitely do get appreciated, and they get focused on in a way that most men don't focus on them. Uh, when, when Most straight men, when they're talking about women who they're attracted to, so there's something there, but I think it's important to, not to generalize about femininity in general, but just to say femininity as we observe it, you know, in the, in the developed West. I don't know, does that seem fair? It seems very fair, and, uh, and then to kind of continue on with this idea, you, you write um, that women tend to be good at taking responsibility for relationships. Mm-hmm. And you, you say sometimes too much so. The one thing women can't control is the quality of her partner's attention to her. Uh, and, you know, I find that a lot of my uh, patients or clients, um, females, uh, they, they're really upset because their partner seems to be tuned out and, and not paying attention to her and not taking charge of initiating sex, for instance. And Absolutely. I know you see that in your office a lot, too. Absolutely. So, so the woman Absolutely. drags the man into sex therapy, and he's often, because he knows that it's not part of his masculine role to be this way, but he's, oh, there's so many re- reasons for, for his checking out. Yeah. So um, but but I, have, have you seen more of that in, in recent years where the woman's dragging the, un, the less interested man into the, your office? Absolutely. I would say it's the rule. Um, it's the rule. Know, oh. Absolutely. It's the rule. Okay. I mean, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, um, for some reason, things were different. Mm-hmm. It was the man dragging the woman in saying she's free. Yeah. She's not interested in sex. She has no yeah. desire. I don't see that that often. Every once mm-hmm. in a while, 
for the most part, I see a woman dragging the man in, saying he's gone missing. He's just not present. Gone missing. He's not there. Well, you have a whole chapter on that, don't when you? Men, why men go missing in bed. Yeah, why men go missing. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, mm-hmm. to some extent, I think it's, as far as I can observe it, and obviously it's limited by the fact that I'm just observing one culture in, in one point in time, mm-hmm. but the women that I see around me, they tend to have more capacity for relatedness and connection than mm-hmm. most men that I see around me. Mm-hmm. And there really is a divide. I think most uh, women, if they're bisexual and they go out with a woman, they go, oh, my goodness gracious, it's such a difference. This person is so thoughtful. Mm-hmm. They notice mm-hmm. things. They compliment me. They, wanna, you know, <laughs> they, they ask my opinion about something. They're interested in what I have to say. They're not always cutting me off. And <laughs> it's, it's a real difference. Whereas most men don't have as much capacity to be interested uh, as, as most women do. I always joke mm-hmm. that my, my, my wife is interested in everything about my kids. You know, mm-hmm. my kids, my, when they were little, they asked where her, their socks were. They couldn't find her socks. She would be running around the house looking for the kids' socks. It was very, very important to her. And I would say, I don't care. Where are some other socks? Because <laughs> you know? right. I'm a man. I mean, you know, we don't, really, really, really don't care. There are very few things that we men care about. And so uh, I think it's a stress on most women that the fact that they care so deeply about so many more things. And mm-hmm. most guys, they want a good meal, they want to have sex, and then fall asleep or watch the ball game or something and have nobody bother them. I mean, are, mm-hmm. typically men's uh, capacity to stay interested in things is kind of limited. So I think that is a stress that, that women experience. And, uh, you know, I think they're, uh, they're, they're, they're right to complain about it. When it comes to initiating, mm-hmm. unfortunately what happens is yes. that the woman gets upset because the man has tuned out, so she criticizes him. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't hear it as she really wants to make the marriage better, she really wants a connection with him. He just hears it as she doesn't like me. Mm. Because men take these things really, really simply. And they feel that they've just disappointed her, and they can't stand the Most men can't stand the idea of disappointing a woman. That's why That's guys right. ghost, ghost women, because they just can't stand the idea of saying to the woman, you know, it's just not going to work out between the two of us. And the woman says, it's okay, it's okay, I can, I can deal with it. And, he, and guys don't really know that. So the guy uh, feels he's disappointed her, so he retreats and withdraws. And that makes her even more angry. And so he retreats mm-hmm. and withdraws even more. And that's usually what's going on when the guy has gone missing in bed. He's retreated. She's gotten upset. It's made him retreat more. And sooner or later, um, they're just on different sides of the bed. Different sides of the bed. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're, just, they're just not connecting. And she's become more and more strident and angry, and her stridentness and anger uh, is, ter- is turning him off. Mm-hmm. And, she's, and that's the one thing that men don't understand about women, is that women elementally need to be desired. A woman oh, yes. complains that a guy doesn't initiate, and the guy says, I don't know, what's the big deal? Why don't you initiate? And the woman goes, you don't understand. You don't understand. It. It, it, it may be fun in a good, thriving sexual relationship for a woman to initiate once in a while. That could be kind of fun. Um, yeah. But no woman wants to have to initiate because she doesn't really then get that affirmation that says that she's desirable, which for a lot of straight women that I talk to, if not most, is a really, really big thing. And uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of women tell me that, that feeling desirable is one of the most important parts of sex. And guys oh, don't yes. really understand that. You know, in it's my a book, fundamental I joke, need I joke, for the woman to what feel I, I joke, desired. I joke in the book about, about, about rat sex. That, uh, yeah. you've, you've, you've seen the videos about rat sex? I think I have. It's yeah, been a while, they, they but I think I have. They've various, shown various times at sex therapy meetings, couples therapy meetings, and the, the female rat runs in front of the male rat and uh, kind of wiggles around a little bit and then runs off. And mm-hmm. if, if all goes well, he chases her. And the female mm-hmm. rats love this. They just love this. And they just run, run, run as fast as they can, and the male rat is chasing after them. And uh, <laughs> finally, if he's chased well and hard and with really good vigor, she lets him have her. And rat sex, I don't know, lasts maybe two seconds or something like that. But the foreplay, the chasing, goes on for a long, long time. And, yeah. you know, 
I'm sure you've had the experience being in a you know meeting, a professional meeting of sex therapists, and they're showing these videos, and every woman in the audience is jumping up and down, going, "Yes, yes, that's it, that's it, that's what we want." <laughs> I remember another rat study where the rats were mating, and bread bread crumbs were spread out, and the the female noticed the bread crumbs immediately, and the male just kept on thrusting. He was not interested. He was totally focused on the female. Well, he was probably just, he was tired after all that running. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> he didn't want to go give breadcrumbs, or maybe she'd run off again. <laughs> yeah. He goes, okay, but, I got but, her now. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to interrupt anything uh, because, uh, because, you know, that was really exhausting having to run after her. I don't want her to do that again. But men seem, uh, especially single men, or maybe even married men, but I think single men enjoy the chase. Uh, I just just before the show, I saw a couple where they're young, and she's withholding sex, and he's really kind of figuring, trying to figure out how he can get her to. She is still a virgin; she's very young, but how he can get her to surrender, and he keeps chasing, and he keeps chasing and hoping. Wow! And interesting. does she enjoy this? No, <laughs> she does not. In this not- case, no. Are they no, married? No, but there are some religious factors in there. Are they married? No. no. They're not married. Okay, well, she, she, she probably doesn't want to have sex until she gets married. Well, that's it. That's, is, he gonna, that's, is, he, is he interested in marrying her? Uh, not right away. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, so it is sex? interesting. He wants to have sex first? I think he would just love to have sex first, yeah. But yeah, he, yeah. He, it sounds like for most people like that, that's just not gonna, that's going to be kind of a non-starter. Yeah, she her religious beliefs don't allow it. Um, yeah, because if somebody has such a strong sense of uh, of of a right and wrong way to do it religiously, and I understand that I'm a religious person myself, um, they're going to feel bad if they go against their religious beliefs. Yeah. And speaking of that, I saw for quite a while, and they graduated, I'm happy to report, an Orthodox Jewish couple where Uh for years she uh, was on the birth control pill, and, uh, and, uh, and so she didn't have her periods, and he was happy to have the two weeks off. Uh-huh. from being sexual. He he wasn't a very confident man, sexually speaking. Uh-huh. And then she then she got, goes and gets an IUD, and now she can feel more desire, and and they don't have the... No, no it's then that she has no period when she has the IUD. Right. So now they can have sex more regularly, but then he's not so interested. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's, it was a fascinating couple, and they're both, of course, very bright. Mm-hmm. And... We we worked on things, and he got past. Yes, there were some performance anxiety issues, uh, including premature ejaculation, which is fairly common for anxious men. Sure, even and, for uh, anxious men, it's pretty common. Well, that's right, and especially young men. But this guy was in his. Uh, he's in his late forties. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, they eventually came to compromises and negotiated um, a, a better sex life. And that's doable. I mean, I know you've seen couples with this. Absolutely, with this absolutely. Problem. You know, it's, yeah. it's, the trick is to uh, uh, have a, uh, a good heart about it and mm-hmm. be interested in making a good solution that works well enough for both people. And the key word is enough. It may not be exactly what you would want in the ideal world, but it, may, it works well enough. And the triumph of it is that both people are reasonably okay with it. And yeah. that's, that's when you really become a couple, when you've made one of those. Yes. And um, you, you write, uh, Dr. Stephen Schneider, that um, you write that um, you don't have to feel a lot of desire to have good sex. Oh, right, yeah. And this would you the, expand on that? I, I, I think that that's, that's also a, a, a a new approach for lots of people who write about sex. Well, it's 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 actually I I didn't in, invent it. It was invented by somebody in your neck of the woods in Vancouver. Uh, it was Rosemary oh, yeah. Brown. Um, yeah, right. Who talked, about, who talked about women who tended to have lowish desire 
or women mm-hmm. whose desire was what we call responsive. You know, if they didn't have sex for a year, they wouldn't really miss it necessarily. But if somebody's given them something good to want, they could have good sex. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's just responsive to whether there's any good sex available, and whether somebody's giving them something worth wanting. And the idea is that it isn't desire that drives sex, it's sex that drives desire. And so that's a very intuitively pleasing idea because it really does fit with a lot of people's experience. It's not uh, such a great fit for high-sex women who really do have desire, have spontaneous desire. There are a lot of women who do, but the majority of women have more responsive desire. And it's not a great fit for most younger men, but older men... Usually, you know, the, 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 the sly saying in the sex therapy community is that men, as they age, they become more like women. So mm-hmm. men become a little bit more like that. If they can have good sex, then their desire might come along. But in the absence of good sex, they, their desire might really wane. It's not just this automatic engine. That's something that women tend to misunderstand about male desire. They think it's automatic. Yes. It was Gail Sheehy who, oh, mm-hmm. probably 30 years ago, when maybe more now, uh, when she wrote Passages, it's, mm-hmm. and maybe it was a subsequent book. But anyway, she said that somewhere after 50 years of age, there's a crossover where women become more assertive. They talk about what they need and desire, and men become more romantic. They're more willing to slow down. They're, they're suddenly more interested in foreplay. Yeah. And, and so that's a nice crossover because the man's anima, her, his female energy increases, and her animus, her male energy increases. So that's, yeah, you know, it's that said seems to work out in the bedroom. The greatest, the greatest pairings are a very, very young man and a midlife woman. Um, yeah. Because they're both, uh, you know, hungry for it. And mm-hmm. a older man and a uh, rather youngish woman who's a little inexperienced and maybe needs a little waking up. And so, you know, you can see interesting pairings that way. Obviously, you know, a person has to be an adult and everything. But um, that uh, uh, people do sometimes uh, have all sorts of seasons in their sex lives. Lots, lots of seasons. Uh, Lots of seasoning is required, too. Exactly. Um, And so, you know, it's very important in midlife to to know that, you know, it's not spring, it's late summer, maybe it's early fall, and it's just got its own dimension to it. And so uh, you may not feel desire as automatically, uh, and your body doesn't necessarily channel desire as automatically. So you need to do a little of what we talked about earlier in the hour, the two-step, and uh, just kind mm-hmm. of uh, let it, uh, you know, let it, let it tune up a little bit. Mm-hmm. You, um, you write in the notes section of your book. I'm so, I'm um, so glad you went to the notes you know, it's, oh, I love I love all of your book. Uh, the notes the, uh, are very the, the, interesting. The main to me. body of the book, I tried to keep as untechnical as possible, just for you know, basically yeah. somebody who wants practical help. But then for a professional uh, who's reading it, uh, uh, there's most of the technical stuff is in the back. So I'm so glad you went to the back. I did, and so here's here's what I wanted to talk about. Now you say most couples I know who have happy, mutually negotiated, open relationships. Now, I'm moving to open because you mentioned about more mature couples here. Yeah. Uh, either gay men in monogamish unions, and that's uh, Dan Savage's word, monogamish, people who are into kink, um, and so on, you write more, or older couples who have the time, energy, and maturity for such things and whose kids have left the house. There's little yeah. doubt in my mind that the next sexual revolution will be led by right retirees. And I, I, I was fascinated by this because, as, as you may remember, I'm also a gerontologist, and I had some studies that I did with an MD in the early 90s that were later on aging and sexuality that were later published in medical journals. So I've always been interested in aging and sexuality, and now that I am an aged person, with yeah. a husband, and we have such a robust sex life in our 70s, and we're thrilled about that. But that's very interesting to me, and I think that that makes sense, that when the children have left the home, and you have all this, this time, and you have maturity, mm-hmm. and you probably communicate much better, 
uh, and you have more confidence about saying what you want and need, and, and maybe there is that Gail Sheehy crossover uh, I think that as the, well. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the reason I wrote this is because in my office I've seen a fair number of uh, retirement age couples who uh, do a fair amount of partner sharing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, surprising at first, but uh, now I'm not so surprised. Mm-hmm. Does, it inter- figure, does it interfere you don't, you don't at have, all you with... Have, you don't have children who are around who are going to, like, you know, say, what are you doing? You know, because they don't even like it when, when parents have sex with each other, much less with somebody I, else. I know. Yeah. That's really so, true. So, you know, the, the, the original Jane Gall, Goodall's... Uh, experiences with chimpanzees in Gombe Stream in Tanzania, where she said that this is how chimpanzees mate. Even in chimpanzees, you get this. The, uh, uh, the male and female ch- chimpanzees will mate, and all the children of the group will try and pull them apart. The and then you move over to their cousins, the, the, the bonobo monkeys, and, and the they bonobos, have sex. Yeah, the they bonobos don't, I don't are different. Think, I don't, I don't think they the make love, not are, war. I don't think the bonobo children seem to mind as much. However, I'm of a strong mm-hmm. opinion that we're more chimpanzee-like than bonobo-like. I don't. Think, oh, I think so too. Yeah, I don't think we got the bonobo gene. I think we're really, uh, you know, we're de- <laughs> we're descended from the chimpanzee part. <laughs> but the bonobos is, don't. They're not as. They're they're not violent at all. I've yeah, seen movies of them and I've read about they can, them. They can be violent. Uh, female on male violence is well known among the bonobos. That's that's how it becomes a oh. matriarchal society because the females band together, and if any male tries to mess with any of the females, they'll they'll just get together and really just kind of rough him up. Well, that's a good point. I I I didn't. All I knew was that they solved a lot of their problems by just having sex. They do solve male and female, that. female with female, male with male. The one combination I read, and maybe you can correct me, is that, that um, mother and son do not have sex. You know, it's a great so, question. Um, you know, we don't yeah. observe bonobos in the wild. We only observe yeah. them in captivity. So it's kind mm-hmm. of limited. But I'll take your word for that. <laughs> yes. All right, let's get, back. let's get back to your book. Back to human beings, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and human beings. Um, the um, yeah, you said something that really resonated with me because of a couple that I am seeing, and I have to go to go to it. It's um, I just love your book so much. Diana, you, you know, I you know, one writes a book in such isolation that it's just so uh, so uh, um, relieving that someone found it of value. Thank you, especially somebody who oh yes in the field. Oh yeah, it's and I've recommended it to so many of my clients, and they've bought it. And um, so, you say um, that um, that that sexual selves need acceptance and understanding. And once your sexual self feels accepted and understood, then it can calm down. Once it no longer feels forced or manipulated, then it can act on its own free will. And that resonates for me because I've had a lot of women with low desire who are pressured by their partners. And that's, I've, that's I've, always said, I've always said, you know, to them, you need to allow some space so that your female partner can get in touch with her own sexual desire and she can't get in touch with that if you're just pressuring her all the time to to have sex. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I actually wrote that about a slightly different subject. I wrote it about oh. mm-hmm. um, what we were talking about at the beginning of the hour, where we were talking about people who were trying to figure out various technical ways of juicing up their desire like with mm-hmm. the, you know, the sex holiday, the sex vacation, and so forth, or just yeah. going to the bar and flirting with each other and that kind of thing. And sexual self tends to see that as kind of a demand on it. Okay, well, let's get something sexy going here. And it doesn't mm-hmm. respond very well to the demands because one of the things I say early, early on in the book, the sexual self is infantile. And it doesn't yeah. respond to demands that way, just like uh, an in, a, a child doesn't respond to demands. You know, you say to a child, go kiss your Aunt Agnes, you love her. And he goes, no, I don't like her at all. I don't want to kiss her. <laughs> so you just 
can't command it. It has to be on its own. So you have to give the person... And that's one of the reasons I like this two-step technique that we were referring to a little while ago. Yeah. Is at the mm-hmm. beginning, it doesn't require anything. You can feel mm-hmm. anything you want. You don't have to feel desire. You don't have to feel good. You can feel anything you want. You can express anything you want. And so you're starting exactly where you are. And at that point, there's a great relief. I mean, the classic example of this is the guy who's in bed with a woman and can't get an erection. Yeah. And he goes to the doctor. The doctor says, just get in bed the next time and tell your partner you're not going to have intercourse that time. He goes mm-hmm. and tells her that, and he has an erection right away because mm-hmm. he's not under demand to do something. Right. With and so it's just absolutely huge. When we feel under demand or we can feel commanded to do something, then we don't want to do it. It's just the natural yeah. childishness of the sexual self. It's just not natural honesty, really. And, and so in a honesty. case where, where a woman very often feels uh, uh, that her partner is being domineering because, you know, men are bigger than women. And often, mm-hmm. at least traditionally, they have more economic power. Uh, a woman tends to care more and worry more about the rest of the family and is concerned about what would be the implications for the family if the family broke up and the family's economic mm-hmm. well-being and thinking about all those things. And so... Traditionally, it has given men in society dominance and power, and they do exercise that dominance sometimes. And so uh, for, for a long, long time, women have felt compelled to have sex in order to, uh, to keep the man happy and very often dominated or compelled or sometimes even harassed into having sex. And I think that really explains the prevalence of low female sexual desire 50 years ago. I think it was a reflection of what was going on in the culture. These days, most women have much more independence than they used to, obviously not all, but most college graduates are women. Most people in entering classes in professional schools are women. And by and large, most women are doing better economically than their male partners these days. And so the whole power dynamic has shifted. Now it's the woman who feels entitled to sex and the guy doesn't really kind of know what the rules are anymore. But back in that traditional kind of situation where the man had a tremendous more amount of power, there was a certain domination that was occurring, and that domination is a sexual turnoff because you're compelled. Yeah, this has been very hard. This has been very hard on men. Well, the, the it, was pretty hard. it was pretty hard on women 50 years ago, well, yeah, 2,000 years ago. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, okay, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I guess I don't feel that bad, the, bad for the men. Um, but uh, certainly it's been confusing. Confusing. Yeah. Confusing certainly. for the men. Yeah. yeah. Certainly they don't really know what to do. And uh, yeah. I, see, I see guys all the time, young guys in my office, and very often their mothers uh, were uh, open-minded, uh, uh, generous, liberal feminists, and uh, mm-hmm. taught them mm-hmm. about, you know, don't be an ass and uh, communicate and don't harass anybody and uh, you be equal partners, find out what the other person uh, wants and is interested in. And uh, the guy is uh, quite interested in his partner's pleasure. Only problem is it creates other problems. Very often she's bored because there's she's no bored? passion in it. She's bored. There's no passion in it. Mm-hmm. There's no energy in it. And uh, what she really wants is she wants his selfish male energy directed at her because he finds her irresistible. And mm-hmm. she wants to feel his passion. And the problem with, uh, you know, as I sometimes say, good communication can kill great sex because there's almost too, com- too much communication. There's too much concern about your partner. And most people ideally would like to be kind of ignored by their partner at the peak of passion. They just want their partner to be just lost in their own experience. It's like most women love the last few seconds before a man ejaculates during intercourse where he's not thinking about them at all. He's just totally lost and he's just totally absorbed in the sensations and he just lets go. And most men feel the exact same way when a woman is about to climax. The fact mm-hmm. that she's just, it, just absolutely gone into a tunnel of selfishness. That's very, very exciting. The idea of pleasuring you, your partner, communicating with your partner, finding out what your partner wants. Yeah, those are wonderful things. They're not that hot, unfortunately. 
not that hot. And you write, and you also, that's another thing you write about in your book that not a lot of uh, sex writers have noted, and that is that it, that selfishness can be really important for passion. And you just, is passion. you just described it. Absolutely, that's passion. I mean, as I always joke, no hero yeah. in a romance novel ever rips the heroine's clothes off and says, okay, now tell me how you like to be touched. <laughs> you know, he, just, he just consumes her because she's so delicious. You know, and women are flipping through the pages. Of this book. Really good. <laughs> and she likes being uh, the object of desire. Yeah, she's consumed because she's just so delicious. Yes. So delicious. So we're back to... Um, which you correctly said, uh, it may West's comment that it's um, that it's better to be, be um, over than, than to be overlooked. Than overlooked. Yeah, uh, presuming to be that object doing, of desire. Presuming the person who's uh, looking over you is the person who's worthy of you. Worthy, exactly. Yeah, yeah. it could, couldn't be just any schmo, you know. It's, um, right. You know, when two teenage girls get together at the end of the night and they, they're, they're uh, uh, talking about how many looks either each of them got that night, um, they're not just talking about looks from anybody. They're talking about looks from a guy who, you know, they might have conceivably been interested in. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And um, on dating apps, the people that tend to do the best, and I think this was in the Atlantic, the, the Sex Recession mm-hmm. article, the, t- the ones who tend to do the best on Tinder and some of the other swipe right or left are people who are good-looking, who have a certain amount of uh, resilience, psychological resilience, mm-hmm. um, and um, who have a good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and uh, all of those things. And, and otherwise, it's entertainment for some people just to... Swipe right or swipe right, swipe right. You well, know, you know, and, and, and I think it's they a don't deep go subject. for. Mm-hmm. I think it's a deep subject because yes. one of the traditional attractions of sex is uh-huh. that it's, nar- it's narcissistically gratifying. Mm-hmm. You really are the other person's com- object of their complete attention, and they are mm-hmm. the object of your complete attention. For most of us, we don't get that total narcissistic gratification beyond the age of like two or three years old. We started out mm. that way. We were the object of our mother's complete attention during early That's infant right. care and breastfeeding. But we give that up as adults. In sex, we go back there. and We're again the object mm-hmm. of the other person's complete attention. It's extremely narcissistically gratifying. Mm-hmm. These days... You can get that kind of narcissistic gratification just by getting a lot of swipes on Tinder. Yes, one of the that's reasons right. they don't have so much sex in Japan is because their narcissism is satisfied by other stuff. You know, the class, like the real life the dolls. The traditional, the traditional example of this was famous people. Famous people mm. got really messed up this way because they could get so much narcissistic gratification from their public that they didn't really need it from their partners. And they, you see all these Hollywood divorces. And that's the right. reason for it. That's the reason for it. Mm-hmm. These days, that happens to everybody. They're getting so much narcissistic gratification publicly, even if they're not famous. You know, you go on Tinder, and if you're a beautiful woman, you could get like 100 swipes, and you go, hey, I still got it. And you don't really need that one-on-one narcissistic gratification that sex used to be the main thing to supply for people. So mm-hmm. you have a lot of people who just do the Tinder. They never even, never even get together. So it's a problem. It is a problem, and it doesn't have any easy solution at all. No. I also think that, I don't know if you observed it in your practice, but I think the golden era for Internet dating was the early 2000s and early 2010s with sites like Match, eHarmony, OkCupid, JDate if you're Jewish, and a few others, and... uh, you you put a little bit into it, and you cruised around on it, and there was something to read, and you spent a little time, and it was a whole thing. And I actually saw a fair number of couples who got started that way. These days with the apps, with the swiping thing, I don't see that many people really getting together from these apps. It may just be my sample. Do you see the same trend or not? Absolutely, and I'm also living it out because Brian and I met through Match.com. Okay. And 
And when I was in, after my last husband died in 2000, I, I was in Los Angeles for a while and working at UCLA's Female Sexual Medicine Center and so on. Um, but there were so many narcissistic men, and I was a member of Match.com and eHarmony. Mm-hmm. And I did want to remarry eventually because I like sex, and I like a committed let me back up. I like a committed relationship, and I like sex. And, and so then I came to Seattle, and two years after I came to Seattle, eight years ago, I met Brian through Match.com, and we are so well matched. It, we are just, I want to write them a thank you note. <laughs> <We're> just, <laughs> but I think, it's, I think it's, it's more difficult to make that kind of connection on the apps. Than oh, it absolutely. Is. You make a very good point. On a website, I just haven't seen that many successfully hitched couples uh, from the apps as I used to from the websites. Yeah, and in fact, my daughter met her husband, and they've now been married uh, almost, yeah, almost ten years. Very well, very well com- committed, and their marriage is wonderful. Mm-hmm. And they met through eHarmony, and I feel proud as a mother because I suggest that she join eHarmony. And she almost immediately met her husband, who's Canadian, and she was then in Oregon, and he was in Victoria. Mm-hmm. So they would have never met without never would have met. eHarmony. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would have never met Brian without Match.com. Exactly. So I think you're right. There was a golden era mm-hmm. for I online dating. I wish we could it back, um, but it doesn't. It seems like things have sped up to where it's really apps and it's swipe right and swipe left. And I got nothing against it, but it doesn't seem in practice to be. Uh, leading to the same kind of uh, committed partnerships in my office as the others. Yes. So, yeah, I the, think the, that you, that's you right. You observe the same thing. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. And Dr. Schneider, um, Dr. Steve, <laughs> Stephen, we have to stop at a f- couple of minutes okay. before the top of the hour. So I just want to thank you again for you. Oh, listen, thank you for having me. But so much to this program over the last year. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, by it's, my count, you were, you were one of the five first times to, to pick up uh, on the book, and I uh, really have appreciated your support and encouragement. And yes. I hope that your audience has, uh, has has enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun for me, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been, and I will. People will get your book because they need to get your book, and I'll do the write up <laughs> and give them a contact. From your mail to God's ears. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye bye, everybody. You too. Happy feet. Happy feet. Happy feet.